to introduce today's speaker, Travis Nauman, who is a soil scientist in uh, Moab, Utah with USGS. Um, Travis did his um, PhD at WVU and focused on digital soil mapping. He was then with NRCS and has since moved on to USGS. He's continued to focus on DSM and is doing a lot of great work, um, which he'll be talking to us um, about today. Travis is also an integral uh, member of the DSM focus team, particularly the properties sub team. And we're happy to have him there and happy to have him talking to us today about applied digital soil mapping. I'll turn it over to you now, Travis. Thanks, Suzanne and Sean. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you all. And um, we've got a little crowd in house here in the conference room, so um, maybe we'll get some feedback from them as well. Um, I think it's really great that the National Soil Survey Center is doing these webinars. and. Um, excited to kind of share some of the stuff I've been working on and hopefully it'll inspire some ideas and um, uh, from the folks that are out there listening. Um, just wanted to check in really quick. Can you guys see my slide here, Sean? Yep, it looks good, Travis. Sweet. And you see my cursor going all over the place here? Yep. Cool. Thanks. All right, so yeah, t today I'm going to talk about what I'm calling applied digital soil mapping. So essentially kind of using new quantitative tools um, to kind of more formalize pedology and kind of soil science um, concepts to try and create new information to help uh, folks manage landscapes and kind of understand soil variability. Um, and so, so as, um, as Suzanne mentioned, I'm a soil scientist for the USGS um, out of Moab, Utah, uh, with the Southwest Biological Science Center. Um, so what I'm going to try and go over today is talk a little bit about some kind of foundational soil science um, concepts and then kind of put them, connect them to um, uh, what kind of how uh, we apply digital soil mapping and talk a little bit about what that means. I'm kind of go over what some of the general workflows that we use in digital soil mapping. Um, I wanted to touch base on validation um, and just to talk about what validation is because it's kind of come up as a question and, and some of my different uh, interactions with folks that are kind of being introduced to this stuff. Um, put a little plug in for the National Cooperative Soil Survey DSM focus team that Suzanne mentioned. Um, talk about a little bit of the stuff we've been up to. Um, also, um, kind of the meat of the presentation will be going over some applications of digital soil mapping and how kind of some of these new data sets and new tool sets uh, can be used to, to inform research and management. Um, so, pedology, what is pedology? Um, I mean, I think a lot of the people on the phone or on the, on the online will have their own thoughts, but I, I kind of think of it as, as kind of that, that understanding that um, you have as a soil scientist of, you know, what soils you're going to find where and what are the drivers uh, that, that kind of um, determine what spatial variability in soils look like. And so, you know, you, you know you're in a location, in this case, you've got some pictures from uh, soil judging way back in the day in Alabama, and you kind of have a, a soil landscape model in your head about what you're going to find in a given location. And so kind of behind that all and uh, a lot of kind of our, you know, foundational education in soil science, we think of the soil factorial or soil forming factors. And so kind of at the top we have kind of drivers in soil formation um, being kind of organisms and climate, so the kind of energy inputs into the system and they kind of act on a soil body and they act on kind of the parent material within kind of the context of the relief of the site over time. And so this is kind of a foundational, um, you know, paradigm in soil science and we tend to look at it from a very soil-centric point of view. The other thing we always want to keep in mind is that this is a, we call it a factorial because everything is still interacting. And so the, the cool thing from a soil science point of view is that means that we can help answer a lot of questions that maybe aren't soil centric and be um, be players in kind of an interdisciplinary sense and help help um, really answer a variety of questions. And so I think that's something that's really cool about uh, being a soil scientist. And so, you know, one kind of example of that that um, maybe is less publicized uh, were some of the works by Hans Yenny later in his career, and he was kind of one of the you know publicizers of the soil forming factors. Um, you know, with his kind of 
uh, seminal work in 1940, but another example would be an ecofactorial where we really can look at some of the same drivers, climate and organisms, kind of acting within kind of their context and topography and paramaterial and over time. And, and so when we go out in the field and look at an, an ecosystem and uh, where it's at, we would see kind of that, the state of that system at that point in time. And so we can kind of, you know, think about this factorial in different perspectives to answer different questions. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that from the digital soil mapping perspective, it's, we think about it more in a predictive sense where we might have a, um, a soil or a system property that we want to either predict, map, or maybe understand the drivers a little better. And to do that, we would we could proxy some of these uh, soil forming factors with with some of the um, different um, spatial data that's available that is kind of proliferating, you know, over over the recent decades. You know, thinking about remote sensing and digital elevation models and gamma radiometrics. You know, the list goes on and on. Um, and so, and then you know can also employ kind of spatial tools, thinking about geostatistical tools. And then, of course, we always need to bear in mind when we're using these kind of frameworks where we're using kind of predictive algorithms, always want to be aware that there's going to be error involved. Um, and so what does that look like kind of from um, a workflow perspective? So if we kind of start here in the upper left, we would have, you know, kind of those stack of environmental raster covariates that we're using to kind of proxy the, the system. Uh, proxy the soil forming factors, if you will. And then we'd kind of go down here to the lower left, and so we'd have the set of field observations that we have that we can kind of query all those different um, all those different environmental variables for those locations. And so one of our big goals in digital soil mapping is often to interpolate between those points. And so to help us with that, we would we could fit a model, so use a some kind of linking model. And uh, machine learning techniques are pretty popular in this. and um, and so once we fit that model, then it helps us to kind of extend the inference of, you know, our field observations to that entire grid of uh, environmental raster covariates that we have so we can um, actually predict between those locations and um, try and try and maximize the, um, the use that we can get out of our field observations because field observations are, um, they're expensive, they're hard to get. So, um, so this is kind of probably the more popular, most popular workflow in digital soil mapping. But in the end, what we're really trying to do is just formalize the soil landscape relationship. It's kind of what what we've been doing in soil science all along. Where, you know, we're taking, you know, the the information that we collect in the field, and we're and then we're going back and we're trying to look at it, you know, with all the different kind of new computing and data tools that we have available to us. So just to kind of demystify what the the whole digital soil mapping lingo here. Um, and so kind of to talk more about kind of different types of workflows that we have. So I mentioned before we kind of have this interpolation between observations. And so, um, you know, that might be classes where each location has a certain soil class attributed to it and we try and predict between those locations. But then it gets a little more complicated when we talk about soil properties like organic carbon or clay because often those need to be depth-specific uh, depth uh, maps that we create. And so there's two kind of lobes of, of um, approaches that people have taken to try and deal with this property by depth um, structure. And so one would be this 2D approach where a separate model is created for each depth increment. Um, and so some examples of that would be the global soil maps produced for France. Um, and then the other approach is what's well, been kind of coined the 3D modeling approach where you'd create one, one model for each property and you'd include depth as a covariate. And so in that case, your observations going into a model would be your horizon or each soil layer um, and the property attributed to that. And so some examples of data products that have utilized this 3D approach would be the global soil map in Australia and some of the soil grids um, products. And kind of the example you see at the bottom here would be um, from the, the um, soil grids project within the, within the conterminous U.S. where we use the National Lab characterization data out of Lincoln. Um, see all the locations on the left here um, with a bunch of environmental covariates and, and machine learning to then predict, in this example, um, percent clay at five centimeters. Um, so another uh, workflow that um, 
is, is well represented in the literature would be kind of expert-based techniques. And so probably the most well-known would be the Solum, which Ajing Zhu kind of pioneered in the 90s. And this is where you'd have, um, you know, you'd try and quantify a local um, soil scientist's expertise and have them kind of go and work with them to define those relationships between the soils and different soil forming factors and using kind of the rasters maps that proxy those. And, and from that, you can kind of put that all together to, to predict your soil. Um, and so kind of the, the third kind of major lobe of DSM workflows would be uh, what's been kind of coined generally in the literature is disaggregation, where you have um, existing soil survey data, and you might have additional, these kind of additional GIS raster environmental layers um, that you want to use to tease out additional variability that are within kind of these conventional soil survey map units that, that we're all very used to in, in the soil survey program um, to, to tease out um, the variability, because often soil map units will have multiple soil components. Um, and so this is an example of some work from West Virginia um, pilot study doing that. And, and in the end, so you can, you know, predict the classes within a, within a map unit, and then if you have property data that are attached to all those soil classes, then you could link that and then actually create property maps from this. And so a good example of that and probably, you know, the most well-known right now is Polaris, uh, which is a conterminous U.S. disaggregation approach. And right now there's a paper in review that actually is deriving properties um, from that initial Polaris run of disaggregation, which has out, been out for a couple of years now. Um, so, and one thing we got to think about with all of these predictive, particularly the predictive modeling approaches, is just uh, what do we mean by validation, and how do we how do we assess the accuracy and the predictive ability of these models? And and so one thing I just wanted to stress and make sure is is others. We really want to know how these will perform on a new independent observation. And so this diagram is kind of a real simplified version of. So say these are all locations where we've collected data. We would want to make sure we trained the data on one set, you know, so in this case it would just be the blue locations, and then, and then evaluate um, the, the accuracy of that model on, on a separate set of data, so it would be a validation set. And so this would be analogous to, you know, if you're thinking if you're, you know, if you've done a lot of work in an area, you've, you've, you know the soils well, you know what you'd expect where, there's always that little bit of mystery when you go to a new site where you're like, okay, I think I know it's going to be here, but what, you know, what am I really going to find? And that's that's kind of analogous to thinking about an, an independent validation set. Um, and so what does that look like um, kind of in, in practice? So it's, it's a little different between a numerical model and a, and a class model. And so on the left, kind of we have an example of, of what a validation would look like for a soil property map. And this is from work we've done here in, in the Colorado Plateau. Um, and so really what you want to do is take your predictions from a validation and, then, and look at them um, against with the original measured values, and you can see these bivariate plots. You, the best way to really visualize it kind of transparently is to have a one-to-one -one line. So essentially, the closer all your data is to that one-to-one -one line, the better the model. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a whole suite of statistics people use, and I have some of the kind of more common ones down here. They have some metrics that kind of measure the, the, the match of your trend to that one-to-one -one line, and then there's um, some approaches that look that summarize the residuals of a model. And so uh, a validation looks a lot different when you're, when you're making a class map or a categorical model. And so a uh, really common way to look at data and um, validations from those type of models is a confusion matrix where you have, uh, in this case, um, your, your original observations are, are organized on your y-axis here, and so each row would kind of tabulate your, the instances that were that, um, were that class in your original observations, and then, your, and then across the, the x-axis um, and down all the associated columns would be the predicted values. And so in this case, if we look at you're trying to maximize the numbers that fall into the, the diagonal here, and so in this upper left corner, this, this, this particular class would be a coarse loamy soil. So we, we can see in this cell here that 17 of our original coarse loamy observations were actually predicted as coarse loamy soils. And so there's a bunch of different ways to kind of summarize this data as a confusion matrix. And so um, these are kind of a list of some of those stats, but 
again, this isn't an exhaustive list. There's other ways to look at <clears throat> these type of assessments. But I just wanted to kind of get it, get that out there so that when you're when we're, you think when you're looking at you know these type of models and you're looking at documentation on them, that, that that's kind of out in the open and you kind of know what you're looking for. And so um, one. A group that I've been involved with, and uh, Suzanne mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, was the DSM focus team. And so these are kind of teams within the National Cooperative Soil Survey that are trying to take these kind of methods and workflows that I've just described to you and really get them implemented in, uh, within the Cooperative Soil Survey. And so there's three sub-teams. I've been really active in the property sub-team, but there's full survey update mapping sub-team and initial mapping sub-team. So I just wanted to, again, give them a plug because I think um, getting these methods out and um, people using them is, uh, could be really beneficial as we move forward. And so one of the things we've done as part of efforts for this, um, for this uh, focus team is, is starting to do field weeks with um, different um, groups around the, the Cooperative Soil Survey. In this case, we went and hung out with uh, Tiffany Smith and her crew um, out of, um, we worked out of Gatlinville, Tennessee, and we're working up in the Great Smokies, this is kind of what that landscape looks like. And, they kind of took us around, helped us kind of, took us to field sites. We kind of digest what, what they're up to. And so their big focus is kind of um, updating some map units there to really better understand the soil parent material and, and uh, um, to ultimately help uh, with interpretations on concerns about mass movement and landslides. And so it was a really neat trip. And we kind of took them through some initial exercises in predictive mapping. And this is one of the maps we made, just looking at particle size class kind of across their study area. And, um, and really the purpose of these trips is to, to, to work with teams that want to learn more about this, that think these kind of tools and methods um, will be useful for their work. Um, and we, we learned a lot about the best way to kind of facilitate this. And see there's some kind of pictures of the landscape that we were looking at and some of the different settings. Um, so kind of the end of my plug is, you know, if you're curious and want to um, have a project that you think would be interesting for this, you know, you can check out the web page if you Google NRCS DSM focus team or digital soil mapping focus team, you'll find them. But uh, in the next year, they're going to be doing a couple more of these field week projects, uh, one in the west and one in the east. So they'll be soliciting ideas for that for those of you out there that might be interested. Keep an eye open for that. Um, so now to get, kind of get to the meat of the presentation, so application. So there's all this data out there. There's all these tools out there. What the heck do we do with it? Um, how do we apply it to, to what we're doing, you know, trying to, you know, um, support land management, support good decision making? Um, so I'm going to take, take you all through some different projects that I've been involved with that I think kind of exemplify different ways of doing this. Uh, we're going to be looking at ecological site development in West Virginia. Um, talk a little bit about the Smart Energy Program, the USGS um, that I've been involved, in, involved with with the USGS. I'm going to talk about ecological site group mapping um, out here in the southwest. We're going to get salinity source modeling in the upper Colorado River and also talk about um, alien transport and thinking about dust sources on the Colorado Plateau. So to kind of kick it off um, from some work I did in grad school with West Virginia University in partnership with the Monongahela National Forest and the NRCS, we were looking at um, the frigid soils and frigid ecosystems of the central Appalachians in West Virginia. And so this is a really nice view from an awesome spot called Dolly Sods, which is kind of one of the few places in West Virginia where you actually can get a, a nice big open view of some of these ridgelines, because usually it's really closed in forest. And so one of the questions we had is we, we were seeing these really cool spotosols um, that you see on the right here. And there are some kind of, um, there are some hypotheses about how those are related to kind of reference porous communities for thinking about developing ecological sites. And so those hypotheses were kind of that there is this gradient of conifer composition that varied with the expression of um, spotic soil properties. And so you kind of see the, the diagnostic kind of sesquioxide um, depth curve that you get on the right here with the spotosol and they kind of and they kind of there's a gradient to not seeing those soil properties and they tend to kind of um, they tended to kind of covary with um, forest composition but uh, but not completely because we, we also knew that there is a lot of historic disturbance from the railroad era and big fires and that 
um, kind of good evidence that the forest composition has changed a lot in the last couple hundred years in these areas. And so what we did and where we kind of drew on the digital soil mapping toolboxes is we created a spatial model of this expression of, of spotted soil properties. Um, and you can see it in kind of these maps on the left where kind of the blue areas are areas that have higher probability of expression of these soil properties. And then we had the, we got access to this really cool witness tree database. Um, so there's all these locations from back before the railroad era of kind of uh, property boundaries that they listed the, the tree species. And so what we were able to do is link um, areas where we had more conifer composition during that period of time to these spotted soil properties. And so that kind of gave us evidence to support our hypotheses about these different ecological sites. And then um, <clears throat> to kind of turn that into a management type of tool set, we overlaid areas that we kind of that were on the right side of that last slide that were, had really strong probability of spotted soil expression um, with the current forest inventory. And so that ends up giving us as an ecological kind of state map when we, when we look at those areas where we can, you can see areas that are kind of in what we think of their reference state with, with a relatively dominant conifer component. But then we can look at these areas that are kind of in red and orange here as areas that are p potentially in an, uh, an alternative state which could be good candidates for, um, for different types of restoration work to kind of um, the, the, the composition and, and um, distribution of red spruce is, is a big kind of restoration issue for a couple of different reasons in, in, in these systems. And so, and this is, so this map you see here on the right was something we gave to the Forest Service to really help them kind of do some of their um, restoration planning. Um, so again, you know, the digital soil mapping was kind of the link between all this to kind of help us get to that point. Um, so now kind of switching gears to uh, work with the USGS out here in the Southwest, um, we have a, this new smart energy program push where, where we have a program to kind of minimize the impact of energy development. And so some of the research questions that I was tasked with trying to answer what, uh, where we're kind of determining which areas were harder to reclaim after energy development. Um, and then also thinking about can we model, you know, in these kind of across the gradient if we see differences, how long uh, reclamation of these sites might take. And you can kind of see in the background here what a typical oil or gas pad disturbance footprint might look like. You know, we're, we're starting from, from scratch when we start to, to reclaim these. So, um, and there's, you know, hundreds of thousands around the country. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a big issue um, and a big, um, a big effort. There's a lot of work going into this type of stuff. And so the, the kind of, the approach we came up with um, was kind of a, a, a triage tool set. So we called it the Disturbance Automated Reference Tool Set. Kind of start here in the upper left. It also kind of started with coming up with a good um, underlying soil map at high enough, re at fine enough resolution so we could kind of pick out, first of all, pick out an oil or gas pad because they're a pretty small footprint. Um, and so we made a, a map of soil particle size class, which is a family level um, taxonomic descriptor for um, soils in the U.S. And then uh, we also gathered a bunch of topography layers and some Landsat ratios that we think for this area pick out geology differences well. And then so kind of moving into this next column here, so for each oil or gas pad, we, we look at kind of the neighborhood around that oil or gas pad because we want to our, our main goal is to kind of assess the status of a lot of pads quickly in, with this tool set. And so we look at kind of within a, we looked within a two kilometer radius, we were trying to identify areas that had that same soil texture class, kind of the same general topography and the same general geology. And so we kind of overlay all those um, and we can pull out these kind of reference areas so we can compare the oil or gas pad to and so you can see that in this uh, aerial photography overlay where you get these darkened pixels. And so the reason we do that is because then we can go and query some kind of response variable from uh, remote sensing. In this case, we have soil adjusted total vegetation index. Um, and so what we can do is compare, you can see kind of the little brown spot here where the pad is, so that value to all these areas that we think really are areas of similar ecological potential. So we're comparing apples to apples. And then we, so we look at the distribution of uh, these veg index values to where the well pad falls, and you can see that this well pad is still relatively barren. 
So it's not a, they haven't made a lot of um, progress with reclamation at this particular site. Um, and so why do we do this? Well, it gives us an automated way to look at a bunch of well pads very quickly. And so the analysis we kind of did with this was to look at um, almost a couple thousand well pads that have been plugged and abandoned to see if we could glean any patterns in how things are recovering or how they aren't recovering um, under kind of whatever the different reclamation um, that may or may not have been taking place at these, at these sites. And so this is kind of what that looks like spatially. You can see a, couple, a, little, a little bit of trend from kind of the north down to the south. Um, and so, the, I mean, the main point is that it's, it's a nice, this is a quick triage tool that, you know, kind of utilizes this type of uh, digital soil mapping product to start creating information. And then we can kind of look more in depth at the patterns in, in, those, um, in those quantile recovery indices that we create from this and see that there is some variability within different ecological um, systems here on the left. And we saw some variability within kind of how dominant the, the, the monsoonal precipitation is, um, and then also within different kind of administrative ownership um, regimes. Um, and so it's kind of one application of how we can use digital soil mapping products to really um, help with, you know, look at potential information that we might want to use for policy and management. And then kind of one question we weren't able to answer with that kind of single point in time analysis was the question of how long oil and gas pads are taking to recover. And so we teamed up with um, some colleagues out of the Western Geographic Science Center, uh, Eric Waller and Miguel Villarreal. And they did some really cool uh, analysis where they took kind of this dark quantile and they looked at it across the entire Landsat archive. So you can go back to the, to the early 80s and kind of, and, and with the time series, you can kind of identify the drilling date, you can identify the plugged and abandonment date, and then, and then look at how over time the, the site might be um, recovering. So again, you know, you've kind of give you even more context for maybe um, uh, what, what, the, what the time frame for recovery is. And, I would encourage you to check out their paper on that. Um, so kind of switching gears, same region, but um, some of our work in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management, they've been really great partners in, in trying to get, get these methods kind of um, going and producing some data products for, uh, for, the, for this region. So we're working with a soil, air, and water program to predict a, a, a large suite of soil property maps and ecological site group maps at 30 meter resolution. Uh, we've got an initial suite that we created just from the soil characterization lab database, um, which we're pretty we're moderately predictive and uh, moderate accuracies. Um, and we're also working with uh, Colby Brungard out of um, New Mexico State University to create a soil depth map. And so right now we've kind of we realize that. Uh, that really the, the lab characterization database is a little bit sparse for doing this kind of mapping. And so we've pulled in the full suite of, of National Soil Information System field observations and then use those along with Sergo to create an even larger training set. So that kind of gives us more field, field observations where we have these properties attributed to them. And we're having a lot of success with uh, mapping with that kind of larger, more dense field observation data set to make these maps. We've also worked with the BLM salinity program, kind of using some of these, these, these data sources we're producing to try and help improve um, some of the Colorado River salinity load modeling. And we're also working with the Colorado State Office to kind of further take all these products and take their AIM data to help better understand what, what, what reasonable management targets might be for different types of sites. And, and that, that work kind of plays into ecological site development, developing state transition models, and um, and that and that type of work. Um, so kind of jumping into that, so just just to define what we're what we mean by the upper Colorado River Basin, we're working um, at least for creating the soil maps above Lake Mead for the for the Colorado River Basin. It's a big area, it's about the size of Germany. Um, this is kind of pictures of some of the landscapes um, that you see in the in the basin, but it's it's very diverse. You go all the way from um, from arid deserts all the way up to, sub, to alpine tundra. Um, and so one of the things uh, that we've really been interested in is salinity. And so kind of within all these different soil maps we've been creating, one of my focuses has been um, 
producing electrical, soil electrical conductivity. Um, this is the map that we kind of created from that initial round of mapping where we were using the lab characterization data. Um, you see kind of a, a, moderately ac a, a moderately predictive model that really is probably best used just to figure out what's, what's really saline and what's not saline or maybe even parse it into three. And so one of the things we did for, for modeling, the, the salinity modeling is we wanted to say, okay, um, we want to create, test different potential thresholds for, for what, how different the different soil properties that we've, maps that we've created and, and like bare ground exposure maps um, that I'm going to show you in a second. Um, how within kind of like smaller watersheds within this basin, um, the distribution of those areas, the you know, percentage of an area with, in this case, if we look at this map on the right, um, the percentage of a watershed that has EC that's greater than the 90th percentile in the study area. Um, kind of create, and then we can string different variables together like, okay, areas of high electrical conductivity, areas of high, highly erodible soils, areas with higher than expected bare ground, and test a bunch of different thresholds um, for inclusion in a salinity model. And so this is kind of one of the ways he's creating these binary maps you see on the right where we kind of split out, um, uh, split out different thresholds of these variables that we can kind of try and use kind of a moderately accurate predictive map to, to start um, incorporating things into different types of models. And I'll kind of explain that a little more in a second. But and here's what that looks like for this bare ground predictive map that we created. So this is using BLM AIM, so inventory monitoring data. Um, and, so, and so one thing that we, we realized we had to do, because we were kind of interested in looking at areas that might be more susceptible to erosion, and there are also saline areas that might be potential sources to Colorado River salinity, is we know that bare ground is going to vary by, by your different ecosystems, right? I mean, so you're going to have more bare ground in a desert than you are in a subalpine forest. And so what we did to kind of create this kind of, this kind of binary um, kind of risk indices, we're calling them, is stratify within, um, in this case, we use U.S. GAP vegetation macrogroups. And so we're looking for stuff that's higher than we would expect within each of these vegetation macrogroups. So this map here on the right is one example of that, where we're looking at everything that's above the 90th percentile of bare ground exposure within each uh, ma vegetation macrogroup. And so we created a bunch of different variables from both the soil maps that we created bare ground exposure index, and then some of the prior um, some of the prior variables used in salinity modeling to come up with um, salinity yield predictions. And so, we this is this is kind of what that looks like at at a broader scale. On the left is kind of the new outputs that we came up with. Uh, in the middle is um, prior predictions using the Sparrow model, which is a USGS model that um, basically the, the, inf the spatial infrastructure that both we use and the Sparrow model uses ties a bunch of smaller watershed units together and, and references them with st stream gauges that have salinity measurements from, from inside, from actual stream gauges. And so what we're doing is then we, all those smaller watershed units we create um, different attributes for. So it would be like, you know, your average, average soil electrical conductivity or, or percent of that um, percent of that watershed that has salinity above um, a certain threshold. And so, you know, we started with about 50 variables that, that we thought um, would be important for that. Um, and then we used a, 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 a little different um, predictive function. We used random forest to train that model. But one of the big impetuses for why we did this is the original salinity uh, modeling using Sparrow was all based on one to 250,000 or one to 500,000 geology maps as the inputs for, for kind of figuring out where salinity is going to come from. And so, so we said, okay, well, we can create 30 meter resolution soil salinity maps. So we should be able to kind of help not only maybe improve the model, but then be able to kind of look within these watersheds to get a little bit more of a detailed a landscape scale of um, maybe where we'd want to um, target salinity mitigation efforts. And so, and then this map here on the right is kind of looking at the differences between what we did and what the prior model was. And you can see one of the, one of the things that we saw that kind of in, in, that was different was that we predict a little bit higher yields for the more arid uh, regions of the Colorado River Basin. Um, 
but for the most part, particularly the hot spots, it was pretty consistent with prior modeling, which, and that's mostly the hot spots are mostly uh, agricultural regions and agricultures, and particularly in saline um, basins is um, pretty, pretty um, consistently documented as kind of one of the main sources of salinity uh, in this basin. Um, so one thing that we were able to do is kind of use a, the data reduction technique to come up with kind of the most important variables. And kind of an interesting variable that came out as the most important was the average soil air dry water content, normalized 15 bar, it's a parameter in, um, uh, in the lab database. And so this would, kind of, this would kind of generally be correlated with percent clay or percent organic matter, but also in this basin would have a little bit of correlation with salinity too. So that potential explanation as to why that came out as important. But then the other interesting thing that I was kind of excited about was one of these risk indices where we kind of strung together these different kind of binary maps. So we would say, okay, um, in this case, it's the percent of area within a watershed with EC, bare ground, and erodibility that are higher than the 75th percentile. Um, and so what that tells us is that in areas that, that do have high salinity, that are that erodible soil class, and that have you know, more than expected bare ground, they are potentially contributing to, to salinity yields. Um, and then the other kind of pretty expected variable was the percent of area in a watershed with flood irrigated areas and higher soil salinity. And so that was kind of an expected. So those are kind of a summary of some of the top variables. And um, so the real advantage of why and why we thought this would be um, a, a, a nice tool set is that then we can zoom into one of those watersheds where we've had high predicted yield and look at those variables. And so in this case, this brown, the brown pixels that you see are from that risk index of high saline soils, high erodibility, and um, more than expected bare ground. And, and so you can see within this particular watershed unit, which is up in the Uinta Basin uh, near Vernal, uh, we can see um, some areas near to active agriculture that look like they're probably fallow now and have probably more exposed bare ground than we want are in saline soils and are likely to be contributing to salinity there. So, um, and the other thing we kind of saw was there's a lot of oil and gas development there and we saw some kind of uh, correlation between these, this disturbance index and, and where some of those oil and gas pads are. Um, so you can kind of see that this, this type of data could help, you know, land managers start to target areas that they, or go through and prioritize areas where they might want to do mitigation pro projects or, you know, think about, think about policy decisions. Um, the other kind of cool thing we can do with the way we've built the model is we can run simulations. And so with that risk index variable, we can run a simulation and uh, kind of figure out, you know, where, which watersheds are, are, have higher yields due to that disturbance index being higher. and also kind of add that up in the entire basin. So we could determine that according to our model, we think about 284,000 um, metric tons of salinity load is uh, associated with this risk index variable. And then we can kind of go over and do the same thing for um, the flooded saline agriculture variable. And uh, we found that, oh wow, that's 1.41 million um, megatons are, are metric tons, which which is actually pretty consistent with some of the prior literature. Um, but it's, this is kind of a neat, a neat application because you can start teasing out um, kind of stuff within the model. Um, so kind of moving on to um, ecological site groups. The, so ecological site groups are kind of a, a broader thematic scale for mapping ecological units or for those of you familiar with ecological sites, um, which is a management unit. And what we wanted to do is sometimes um, there have been areas where these the kind of suite of ecological sites that are available are a little complicated. Um, and we wanted to kind of group them based on mainly have them having similar state transition models or basically sites that behave similarly. And so, and one reason that kind of there's a push for this is that these are a potential option for provisional ecological site development within the National Cooperative Soil Survey. And so the kind of the initial work on these came out of a special edition of Rangelands in 2016. And so um, 
So I've been kind of focused on two of these case studies for MLA 42, which is some of the arid regions of New Mexico and down into West Texas, and then some of the, um, the Utah portions of MLA 35, which is south um, eastern Utah, um, and you can kind of see the associated papers with those. And, and so these are what kind of maps of those groups look like. And so um, for southeastern Utah here, and the kind of cross-hatched areas are areas where at the time we did this, we didn't have the, the soil surveys weren't done for that area. But we distilled about 130 ecological sites down to eight ecological site groups. And then in MLA 42, they distilled about 40 or 50 ecological sites down to seven groups. And so, but what we were interested in doing is coming up with a kind of a digital soil mapping workflow to map these to, um, first of all, kind of, um, increase the, or better the resolution, get finer resolution product, be able to gap fill in areas where we felt comfortable with gap filling where there's no soil survey product available. Um, and so we kind of created this workflow where we're utilizing existing soil survey data. We're pulling in these kind of new data sources, these raster data sources that are available, testing different combinations of those, those raster sources, testing different types of predictive models, so different machine learning models, and then coming up with uh, a new predictive map at a finer resolution that we can also model uncertainty with. And so that's what this, this kind of en ended up looking like um, in this slide here with these two maps. This is a paper in review that was headed up by John Maynard. Um, and, uh, and so we're really excited. The, the models came out really good pretty much um, for each class, generally 70 to 80% accurate. Um, which is which is pretty good um, for for these type of um, workflows, and so I'm I'm excited. I'm going to be kind of working on this on expanding these concepts and expanding this mapping for the BLM kind of further north in Utah and onto the western slope of Colorado, and um, we're kind of excited about where this workflow might go. So moving on to the last pro uh, project, um, thinking about about dust, which is kind of an emerging um, issue in the southwest. And so this is a picture from just, um, just east of Canyonlands National Park. And, and this is a uh, picture from that same location a few hours later. So this is kind of a, an example of some of the dust issues we have up by Moab. But um, it's, like I said, it's kind of an emerging issue in the southwest. And so what we have in, in Moab is uh, we have a network of uh, what are called Big Springs Number 8 um, sediment collectors, and we've had um, had some of these out since 2004, and um, we're going to have them across some varying rangeland communities. Um, and those kind of me they measure um, aeolian transport or aeolian mass flux. Um, and we've also got had a network of these out along unpaved roads for a couple of years. And so one of the big questions we've had um, is. Um, is what is kind of the, how, how much are uh, unpaved roads potentially contributing to, um, to dust emissions and alien transport in, in the area? Um, and so I kind of turned to my wheelhouse and said, well, I think I can predict this spatially, so maybe we can use some spatial approaches to try and tease out the, the contributions. And so um, going back to that digital soil mapping framework um, and another way to apply it, so Really, alien mass flux, alien transport is very much related to some of the same soil forming factors. But also, then we can maybe turn some of the soil um, soil maps we've made into another predictor. And so, um, we kind of went with that framework, and then created spatial models for both the road networks of unpaved roads around uh, around the region, and then all the rangelands around in the region we were kind of looking at. And so, um, you can kind of see from the maps, you kind of picks out some hot spots, and, and that in and of itself, particularly in the rangelands um, map, I think can, is going to be really valuable. And we've kind of had a couple uh, brown bag presentations with the BLM out there, and they're excited to kind of use this data to, um, to kind of help with uh, thinking about management. Um, but then kind of to answer this question of, you know, unpaved roads versus rangelands, we kind of, we, we, we did some kind of spatial summation of these different, um, of, of these two different maps that we created. And um, we, we did it in some different scenarios because we wanted to be kind of cautious about how much of the landscape we represented with our sample. So that's why there's kind of these three different 
comparisons we did. But if you look over on the far right, kind of we, we were looking at percent of kind of the summed sediment flux across the region um, that came from roads and versus our that was coming off of rangelands. And so what we found is about like six to eight percent of that sound flux is coming off of roads and then kind of in the 92 to 94 range are coming off of rangelands. And so it kind of gives us some perspective on the magnitude of these. So the roads are definitely like a contributing factor, but you know rangelands are still kind of contributing the vast or the vast majority of aeolian transport is happening on the rangelands. And so and and you know the reason we we, used, we were measuring alien flux is ultimately because it's one of the main drivers of dust emissions. You know, the couple other factors that play into it. And so, and so this is kind of helping us understand. You know, maybe thinking about making sure we don't let unpaved road networks proliferate too much, or maybe we want to, um, maybe we want to do some treatments um, to to um, decrease dust. Uh, but also, we need to pay attention to our range line. So, um, again, kind of another approach where we think about this predictive framework. Um, being able to help us answer these kind of management questions. Um, so I'm kind of wrapping up, giving a little, pl little plug to a group here that has helped us kind of publicize some of our group. And I mean, as you can tell, the, the projects that, that I've been involved with are generally um, very multidisciplinary. You know, we like teamed up with the water science folks and USGS for the salinity stuff. And so the RAMPS group um, and the USGS is kind of one of those, is a group that's helped us publicize um, some of our uh, research and brings together um, various uh, stakeholders and researchers. And so I'd encourage at least the folks in the southwest where RAMS kind of operates um, within the National Cooperative Soil Survey, um, always trying to get people to cross-pollinate. So I wanted to put a plug in for them. Um, and so with that being said, um, I hope everybody has gotten something out of this. There's a lot of content. Um, and I hope, you know, if there's any ideas or if you guys, people want to get plugged into some of these different groups that I mentioned, you know, give me a shout and, um, and hopefully we still have some time for questions. So thanks. Well, thank you, Travis. <clears throat> and I'll just remind folks to, if you do have a question, to go ahead and put that in the Q&A pod and that will show up here and we'll get to your questions. And of course, uh, we do have several questions that have come in. <clears throat> One of the questions I put in the uh, responded to everybody in the Q&A was whether or not the uh, presentation is recorded. And yes, it is. That'll be available on our National Soil Survey Center YouTube channel. And I put the link in there. And a copy of Travis's presentation as a PDF will be posted to our videos and webinars page. So you can copy those links and uh, save those. So some of the other questions, Travis, that have come in, uh, one from Mike. Um, and I think this is when you were talking about the salinity groups, but uh, could you define what moderate success means? So it's like 15% of the time correct, 30% what? Uh, I'm, okay, so moderate success, I think that maybe it was in um, regards to the moderate predictive ability of that. Um, so I'm going to answer it that way, and, and if I'm, I'm not understanding the question, then follow up. But so with that salinity map, um, you know, you can see that the coefficient of determination, our square value was about 0.44. And so what that means is that, you know, it's, it's, it's representing, you know, about 44% of the variability. So there's still a lot of variability we can't represent with that model. And so uh, there's information in there, but we could also still get a lot more information if we had a better model. So that, that would be kind of how I was framing that. Okay. And Mike says, yeah, that was correct. Uh, context for that. Tom asks, uh, do you think resources should be spent improving the population of the NASA's pet on database for use as training sets? And if that so, is, what, what should be the focus? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so the NASA's data set for people who are here with me and, and everybody else, so what we're referring to is all of the field observations that have gone into the National Soil Information System that's kind of the overarching database for the NRCS and Soil Survey. And, and so, you know, there's, you know, there's like, you know, three to 400,000 geo-referenced field observations of, of soils in there. And it's a huge, huge, huge resource. And there's a lot of caveats about it. There's duplicates in it. There's stuff that's not always consistently attributed. Um, and I think, I think that, 
it would be a great idea to, to invest resources into cleaning that up because there's our, it's already usable, but you have to know the caveats of you know what's going on in it. And so, um, my my opinion is that the more that that data can be cleaned up and added to and um, and used for this stuff kind of into perpetuity, the better. So. All right. Another uh, participant, DSM, asks, how dynamic is the EC map, and how does that affect the accuracy predictions? Does the data support the salinity map at 30 meters? Another very good, great question. Um, so, for those of, for those folks you know familiar with salinity dynamics and soils, I mean, salts by definition are are soluble, and so. Um, they can change very quickly, particularly in an agricultural setting, because, I mean, part of how you manage agricultural soils is with salinity is you have to be really careful about, you know, wicking salts up to the top. And so you do find, particularly, you know, when we're looking at these um, depth, you know, soil property by depth maps, that you'll get more, more air and more variability in the surface and less as you go down. And so, yes, there, there are very much is kind of an error signature and a dynamic signature in the modeling we do because salts can change very quickly depending on um, if there's management of them or not. And um, and this is, we've actually kind of redone that electrical conductivity map, like I said, kind of including the, the broader NASIS data. And we were able to improve on that a lot, but, but that was even more where it became more apparent that, um, yeah, you, you do have to consider that and you have to consider you know, what the source of the original data is, the date of it, and has, has management changed since then? Um, and so those are all, you know, things that especially, you know, thinking about, you know, our profession as soil scientists when making sure we understand not only the, the structure of the model, but also the, the dynamics of whatever property that we're modeling and that we, that we are transparent and explain that to people who might be using it. So that was a great question, and, and that would be kind of my best explanation for it. All right, Travis, another question has come in. Can soil series be mapped using digital soil mapping? And if so, <laughs> how difficult is that task? Um, so soil series, people have tried to map soil series, and soil series is kind of the most detailed level of, um, of how the I'm explaining to the group here of how soils are classified for soil survey, and, and it's, it's the level at which most of the properties are attributed. And um, so, a lot of people have tried to map soil series, and they haven't been very successful, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, um, and a lot of that is because they're super detailed, and there's a lot of overlap between the concepts of soil series. At least this is my opinion. And so. Um, it, it has been difficult. I mean, there have been a couple of like smaller case studies that have been able to parse it out pretty well, and then, and this is and there's a lot of variation within like the disaggregation studies that are out there in this. Um, I don't. It's not that I think it's impossible. I think that I think it's it's harder than some of the other the, some of the other properties and classes we we've mapped, and we haven't quite figured out exactly how to get it right. But I also think part of the reason it's hard is because soil series um, thematically are, are less consistently defined as far as like how specific or broad a, the, the concept for a soil series is relative to other levels of taxonomy. Like say for instance that particle size class in the, for, for at the soil family level. So it's, you know, it's kind of a complicated question and, I, and I'd say the results are mixed and we're still kind of figuring that out. All right, well, Travis, thinking back to your days with NRCS, can you think of any ways this work would benefit or support conservation planning? Yeah, I can, and there's a, a ton of different ways. Um, I think, you know, thinking about how, you know, how we group landscapes, and, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to have, to go through enough information to, um, quick enough to be able to keep up with the conservation planning practice um, process. At least that's kind of what I hear from a lot of folks when I'm out and about. Since I'm not directly involved in it, um, and I think that these types of data products, as we make them more available and especially serve them up in interfaces that are more accessible, can help people digest more information quicker. 
to be able to make the decisions they need to be able to make, I think would be my, my best answer to that question. All right, and Matt asks, you had a slide about the importance of independent validation, but most of the error metrics and scatter plots you showed were based on cross-validation. Can you clarify? Yeah, so cross-validation is a form of independent validation. Um, so I kind of showed you guys the simplest concept of what independent validation means. And so cross-validation is where you rerun a model over and over again. And so, but first you split your data into random folds. And so you'd, you'd fit a model to, so in a tenfold cross-validation, you'd have 90% of your data used to, to fit a model, and then you would, and then the other 10% you would use to test that model. And so you do that over and over again until each of your tenfolds has been used once as a test set. And, that, and it's actually a more complete way to look at independent validation than just withholding, doing one withholding and creating a model from that. Um, but I will say that I think really the highest bar for an independent validation is when, when you collect a, a field data set or whatever data set it may be, create a model from that, and then have an independent group come in and do their own characterization of it and with, at their own sites. And I think that really, that really is the highest bar for an independent validation. And uh, Sky has put a comment in the Q&A that validation is a topic covered in our statistics for soil survey training that we have, parts one and two, uh, that we offer through the soil science division. I would also add to that, to Sky's comment, that it's covered in the Intro to DSM course and the Remote Sensing for Soil Survey Applications course. Sweet. So there's a plug for those courses. Learn more about validation. All right. I'm just going um, to include the, uh, the website if people want Sean? to get more information about the uh, Hey, could we, can I see if there's any questions in the room here? Sure thing. Anybody? Okay, it's still. Um, I'm a user of a lot of these tools rather than someone that would produce a soils map, and I'm wondering if you've been thinking about how to create a kind of transparent um, error surfaces for a lot of these metrics. First of all, just to kind of give a sense for someone like me that might use it, you know, where it might not be the best source yeah, yeah. or where there might be a, an issue. Yeah. Just basically a spatial prediction of some of those error attributes for validation. Yeah, so the, the question um, from Stella here was, is there um, mapping products we're creating to kind of show where we'd have more error in these maps than others? And it's, it's a topic I didn't get to, but the answer is yes. and. So there's pretty easy ways for most of these methods to create uncertainty. And so we've also been working at kind of ways to package uncertainty. So an uncertainty might be a 95% a prediction interval. But we're working at right now kind of ways to create relative prediction intervals that are very, much more interpretable. And so we've got actually kind of a, a, a paper we just submitted on that. And, and so that'll be something that we're going to produce for all of the, all of the maps that we create. And so, um, and, that, and I think that it's an excellent question, and that's something that I think um, is super important for, for these data sets. Is there any, was there any other questions in the room here? All right. So we're, we're all clear here, Sean. Well, Travis, thank you for your time and effort to make this presentation, and thanks to all the participants for joining in. We hope you found this information beneficial. We had well over 200 people join today's webinar. The on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our National Soil Survey Center YouTube channel within a few business days, so feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. And this concludes our webinar presentation. Thanks, Sean.